welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Dungeon Special Part 3. <laughs> Today, we have numerous dungeon related books for your listening enjoyment. They will be reviewed on a fair and crunchy status as you've never seen before. But first, before the show begins, I must call in my minions of mischief and mayhem. Minions, arise. Minions, I would like you two to go out into the world and cause mischief and mayhem. Do you think that you can do that, the two of you? Uh Uh-huh. Yes, master. Yes, Master. Very good. Thank you. Go, <laughs> go and destroy mischief, mayhem, madness. And we'll be right back. Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to a very special third edition of the Dungeon Special for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. My name is Ray, and today I'm going to be reviewing exclusively dungeon books just for you. First book up is going to be what? Well, it had to be this, just because we're saying farewell to a very old friend, someone very dear to us. Uh, Cal the Dungeon has come to a conclusion. Uh, Dungeon Eternium, the Divine Dungeon Series Book 5 by Dakota Kraut. This is it. This is the last book of the series. Uh, This is narrated by Luke Daniels, so we're having a bit of a shift at the very end with a book length of 10 hours and 7 minutes. Thanks, little guy. I'm learning so much today. Then he punched down and siphoned off some essence using the runes on his gauntlet. The cat, suddenly weakened and dizzy, stumbled away, only to be met with a heavy blow that made everything go black for it. Dale swiftly added another cord to his bag and walked out of the portal. Huh. Normally I come out and really enjoy the fresh air. Ooh, what changed? Something stinks. Dale! A voice Dale still flinched at broke his peaceful mood, and Minya appeared in front of him. I knew if I waited around here you would show up. Didn't you ask Cal? The mithril-clad mage asked with crossed arms. You can't possibly still hold that against me, Minya asserted while matching his hard look. I know what you've been up to, and all the benefits that you're getting from working with him. You know that there are a lot of people who hate you now, ever since your talk with the master in public about sharing his soul with the dungeon. <sighs> I tell you, this this is just one of those really bittersweet novels. Uh, this is the book that really broke me into the j- dungeon genre, so to speak. And it's been one hell of a roller coaster ride for me. I mean, seriously, it's been ups and downs through the whole series. Um, there, there were some amazing novels and some that just kind of felt a little hurried here or there in some spots. And all I can say is, is I'm going to sorely miss this series. Uh, the characters, Cal and Danny, are so ingrained in my heart. I mean, I love Danny so much, even though she's kind of trailed off into the background as a almost a tertiary character by this book. Uh, she has very little to do and had less to do after she was captured uh, in the earlier books. So if that's a spoiler, I apologize, but Danny has, a, a, has an arc and she's trimmed down more and more as the series going on, but she's totally my favorite character in the series. Um, and like I say, I'm going to miss this, but I'm comforted knowing that even as this book ends, I kind of have an impression that we may get some more in the same thing later on. Uh, there's nothing that says that Cal can't return, uh, that we can't go back. Uh, we don't know what happens. Uh, even at the end of the book, uh, the series, we, we don't have a final uh, what happens to the world kind of thing in, in, you know, like nothing happens in the book that says definitively this is what happened when the meteor struck. Nothing there. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things that could occur. Uh, you know, I'm assuming there's going to be some desolation, some destruction, some calamity. Um, so, you know, that's going to happen. But 
I think that, you know, there's going to be time that passes. You know, they are in, in a special place now, and Cal can kind of weather the storm until things get better back on their world. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hope at the end that they're going to come back. And at this point, there's no spoilers. I can pretty much say that uh, there will be other things coming because we, we know for a fact there's a dungeon a Divine Dungeon Anthology coming out rather soon, uh, next month, uh, beginning of the month. Uh, the Divine Dungeon Anthology Essence will be out. So that kind of picks up and carries on the torch, so to speak, with Cal and Danny's characters or the world or however you want to put it. Uh, so, you know, it's not truly, truly gone at this point. Uh, so Crow can come back in any capacity he likes in the future, although the world may not be in the same place or the same state as he left it, okay? Uh, why? Uh, because the moon is falling, as we know from the last two books, uh, and this is not a chicken little type tale. And again, if this is uh, a spoiler, I have, to, I have to reveal this because this is what the whole premise of the book is. Um, and the only hope that anybody has of escaping the destruction of the entire world is for them to make their way into Cal's soul space. The problem is, is that there's a lot of infighting and outside influences that make it very difficult for him to just kind of welcome everyone into him as much as he would love to. Uh, because by taking them all in, he gets all kind of benefits and boons and sort of things. Um, and, we, and we kind of uh, see him, you know, growing exponentially in power as the book goes, uh, but not in crazy, stupid ways. You know, it's not like you see him just say, oh, well, I'm going from this rank to that rank to that rank, you know, um, just because. Uh, he still hasn't made the ultimate ranks, so you, you kind of see, again, there, there's a lot more hope that we'll get stuff in the future. Um, Kraut really does a great job of tying up plot points, though, uh, and setting up things that will only make sense if you read his other series, The Completionist Chronicles. In fact, there's a whole bit in here um, that I just I, I loved because I just finished Rexus, and I could see how this literally moved over to that book. And the things that happened here played out there in, in specific ways. Um, so, you know, if you're not, sh not sure what goes on, they're tied together in a, in, a, in a specific way that I don't want to reveal. But the, the things that happened in Cal's world happened in the completionist, completionist world, too. Um, and the whole people thing, it, it kind of makes sense to me now. It's like Cal and Danny and Dale, they, they all kind of get like these satisfying conclusions or maybe not so satisfying depending on how you look at it uh because with dale i don't know if i'd be happy or not it, it's kind of hard to say um although it isn't all happy any kind of stuff some of my favorite parts were you know kind of finally learning what like uh the silverwood tree did for example and cal's mis misguided attempt to teach a northman a lesson has severe re repercussions later on uh, and Danny's weird brother. Uh, yeah, Danny has a brother, and he just pops up out of nowhere. Um, we also kind of get to see what happens to all the bad guys, you know, like the Master and um, uh, what's the, the Adventurer Guild's guy's name? I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, you know, the Devourer. Uh, is it Frank? Is it Frank the Devourer? I can't remember, but... Um, he he has an ending, so to speak, in, in the novel. So, like, all the good guys, the bad guys, everybody, it, it all wraps up really neatly. Uh, this has been pretty well plotted out, and it feels fresh and focused. Uh, as compared to the last couple books where I, I kind of thought they felt rushed and hurried, uh, this did not have that tone or, or feel to me at all. This really feels like it was planned out from the very beginning, and we got to this point, and we, we actually slowed down a little bit, took our breath, and did this right. And I was very happy with that. I uh, was just so happy with this. And the only part that really made me pause for a second was when Cal kept doing dungeon stuff, when all the craziness was going on around him with the people in the world. And then I realized that that was pretty much exactly what Cal would do. You know, he would just dungeon, do dungeon stuff. He would dungeon fight all day long uh, just to keep himself focused and calm uh, until he was able to actually do something constructive. Uh, so the book is, is satisfying, and while a, a page is kind of turned, the cover doesn't feel like it's been closed completely. So we may get more Dan and you know Danny and Cal in the future. So uh, how do I do this? Here's the part that I'm really sure you've all been waiting to hear. <sighs> we all know that something occurred with Vicus Adams and Dakota, and they were unable to continue their partnership. Uh, 
anything that you're going to hear is going to be rumor conjecture, conjecture, conjecture because Dakota will not talk about it and Vicus has not spoken about it. Um, and I don't claim by any means or stretch of the imagination to have insider information. So I don't know what happened. All I know is, is that they went to do this book and Vicus was unable or unwilling or whatever to do the final novel in the time that they wanted to have it done. That meant they had to go elsewhere. And while I would like to believe everything happened was amicable, I will say this, and I'm not going to give a web page out or anything like that. There is a posting on Reddit, so if you want to go look it up, look it up, that kind of details the events that may or may not have happened, because I don't know who posted it. I don't know how they know what they know. Uh, but if it's true, um, and, and I really do believe that, you know, Dakota's an honorable man, uh, that he did everything he could to have kept his listeners happy, then, you know, it puts things more on the other side of the fence on, like, why the, the, the narration did not continue. Um, and like I say, I, I don't know what happened or who, you know, it's, this is not a he said, she said, or he, he said, he said kind of story. It's it's just a very sad um events occurred that made it impossible for us to continue our partnership together at this point. Uh, I don't know if that means they can never work together again, but I do know that he won't be doing Completionist Chronicles anymore because Luke also kind of stepped in and did Rexus, and I'm assuming he's going to continue doing more of the Completionist Chronicles in the future. So, who knows? I just know that the, the main thing is, is Dakota was kind of put behind the eight ball. Uh, he, he was kind of given no options or alternatives, other than to do everything he could to keep his series going when he should have just been able to have it taken care of. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Now, that said, <laughs> okay, that said, I have to say what I think of Luke Daniels' job narrating. Now, you know, I'm sure you understand, I have enjoyed Luke on numerous series, including Tamer, Magic 2.0, The Iron Druid, and so on. And I get why they picked him. I mean, after all, he did a great jo job on Voices' Advent novel. Fantastic job. Uh, you know, so he's well known. He does a great job. He's super professional. Um, so I can I can see exactly why they picked Luke for this spot. Um, but I do have a few things to say. First, he just does not do Danny very well. I often could not recognize Danny when she was speaking. And I have to admit that I miss the way that, you know, she would chastise cow or wine out of his name. You know, cow! Like, that was just totally gone. The magic for me was, was kind of lost in that translation. Um, and I also realized that this kind of got dumped on his lap at, you know, like, get it done ASAP at the last second uh, tag attached, you know. So he, he clearly did not have uh, the ability to even attempt to replicate the voices of the main characters. You know, for example... Um, when Nick Podell took over doing the voices for William Moran's Super Sale on Superheroes, he went out and did his best to try to match up voices and accents as he went along. Um, even trying to get the word pancakes right. Um, I, I give him a lot of credit for that. But Daniels doesn't do that here. And I really think um, that that's just due to time constraints. Um, I don't know if he, he would have been willing to sit down and listen to you know, two or three novels that are 17 hours or 15 hours or 12 hours apiece to say, okay, I know what this character sounds like. Um, instead, he just kind of makes up the voices and accents as he goes along. And again, I totally get it. But if you've been a listener of the series from the very beginning, it, it is kind of jarring. And I'm sure that after like two or three or four listenings, um, it'll be smoother in my mind because I'll know who's talking and it won't be quite like, is that... Danny coming in, is that, you know, a Boblin? Because, just as an example, um, the Boblins, whenever they spoke, I always thought they had like this Native American kind of speaking way of doing things, you know? Uh, like, oh, great spirit, uh, we are navigating, you know, and I can't do it that well, but you get the, the impression, you know, they would speak with that kind of an accent. And here, it isn't even close to that. It's not even a try or something like that. So I know he did not have time to, to do what he should have, to do his homework, or if he even had the inclination to do so. I mean, honestly, if I'm taking over for somebody else and I'm going to be the one in charge of that series from that point forth, would I want to put in the time to learn what they sounded like? 
or would I just make up stuff on the fly for myself and maintain from that point forward? I think I'd probably do the latter, as much as I hate to admit it, because I'd rather you know, somebody actually put forth the effort, effort and make it as cohesive as possible. Uh, but I just, I just don't see Luke being as busy as he is having the time to do that. So, again, I understand exactly why this came out the way it did. Um, Luke does a good job. Uh, otherwise, you know, especially for coming into the series so late, um, he, he does a really, really solid, solid job. Um, I just wish that he could have had a little bit more time to get things ready, but the cold hard facts are that the longer a book goes without having the audio come out, the less interest the, the, the normal people have in getting that audio book. You know, people like myself, who that's all we do are audio books, I'm happy to wait three years if I get my narrator. You know, like James Marston's, I'm sorry, James Marsters, who uh, was Spike and Buffy, does the Dresden Files. Uh, they literally had to go back and re-record him doing a book that somebody else did when he was like unable to do the recording in the time that was necessary for it to be published. Uh, because the fans literally snapped and were like, this book sucks, we don't want the new narrator. Which was a, was Glover, a John Glover, which is a great actor. He, he's got a great voice. I can tell you, he probably did a fantastic job. But we we like to stand by our narrators uh, because of unity and cohesion. Um, here, that's no longer possible. It's just it's a sad, sad thing. Um, I will say that uh, as invested as I am in the series, it was a little harder for me to uh, adjust to Luke comparison-wise to Rexus, which I'll say that later on um, in another review in the future, uh, where he kind of steps in and, and he's playing, you know, Jackson, the chiropractor, uh, because the majority of the characters are all new and fresh. I think the only time you see Joe is right towards the end of the book, or maybe at the very beginning and the booking end, book ending it at the end. So, you know, everybody else, um, there's really no conflict there. It's only only here when you have every single character that's been in the series practically popping up that you would have that issue. So I, I give them a lot of credit because they wanted to make sure the fans got their audiobook because, you know, I'm, I've been jonesing for it since the, the book was published. I've really wanted this. And, you know, if I hadn't gotten it, I would have been really upset that, you know, there was no opportunity for me to uh, get to see the, the final end for Cal because I, everybody knows I, I can't read. Uh, with every way my life is, I don't have time. I, I literally can read. I'm an extremely fast reader, um, but I just don't have time to sit down to read. And with all the other things happening in my life now, that is even less, that's actually more of the case where I have less time to do so. So I have to have the audiobook to come to me in order for me to enjoy the series. So they had to put this out. I totally respect it, and I know where they're coming from. I'm just not happy that we had to have this this come to this point at the very last novel. Um, you know, and again, if you want to see what happens, go look up on Reddit and you can make a justification uh, for whether you believe or not what, what they say there. Um, but either way, um, Luke does a fine job. And I think that if they do continue the series some point in the future, it's going to be amazing. Okay, I just think that now that it's out of the way and it's locked down, we should be solid. Overall, for a series finale, uh, this was a very satisfying story. And the only thing that really gives it a, a, a ding, if you will, uh, is the narration uh, switch, which is necessary and understandable and hard to overlook. So final score would have been more, but you do have to have, you have to admit, there's a, there's a, there's a scratch on the, on the side of the car there. Um, so it's an 8.4 stars. What could have been a classic became a family car. Um, still good, still dependable, still enjoyable. It's just not as cool. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I'm, I'm recording all this and it's kind of in a jumble. So I just completed my review of book three for Dungeon World and now I'm doing Dungeon World 2. So it's, it's kind of weird doing it like this. Uh, this will be Dungeon World 2, a Dungeon Core Experience by Jonathan Brooks, narrated by Miles Miley, uh, with a book length of 10 hours and 9 minutes. Fred nodded towards some of the nearby guild members who were dragging an entire building's wooden wall towards the outer stone wall. 
They nodded back with what appeared to be a surprisingly good attitude. Maybe having some sort of plan gave them a sense of purpose. He walked to the exact center of town with DC keeping pace with his progress. And as he looked at all the activity around him, he couldn't help but think that he wasn't keeping his side of the bargain. He looked down at the dire wolf pup, and she looked back with a look that said, You know what you need to do. And now that he was out of his room with his feet flat on the trampled dirt of the town streets, Fred did. Maybe it was because he had been off the ground on the second floor of the DAS building. Or it could have just been his previous state of mind. Either way, whatever was preventing him from understanding how to establish his territory was gone. Or at least much diminished. All right, so this is book two. And I can already say that, without hesitation, this is my favorite Brooks series by far. Um, not to say that his other books aren't good, that they're not enjoyable. Uh, I just think this has got like, a great concept. It's it's brilliantly executed, and it's it's fun more than anything. Fred is just a big doofus, and everything he does is interesting to me. I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. Uh, and Fred just being able to pull out a handful of gold and say, hey, so what do we need to do with this? At, at whatever point is necessary. It's just it's just, it's just, just fun. Um, so, you know, the concept of the book is pretty cool. Uh, I don't think I covered that in the first novel. I didn't really say what happened, so I'm going to say it here. The sentient dungeons kind of rule over humanity, uh, and they do not brook any uprising against them. So if um, the dungeons suspect that humans have done something to harm another dungeon, uh, they do their utmost to obliterate any humans in the area just for the even, you know, the, the, the gall of having the audacity to hurt them in some capacity. Uh, now, Fred Wink Winkle Mossering, which you, you got to have to laugh how Brooks ever came up with that name. Fred Winkle Mossering is the child of two dungeon cores. They're non-aligned factions. I think they're even like, it's like fire and water, so that they don't exactly even come close to meshing together. It's not like it's a, a water and a nature core or something like this. is like, I don't belong with you, you don't belong with me. Romeo and Juliet sort of stuff. Um, and um, Fred kind of has to go out of the zone after his parents are murdered. Uh, in book one, Fred is just kind of getting a feel for who he is and what he can do. Now he knows, you know, now he knows what he is, and, and by that, I mean, he, he always knew he was a dungeon, uh, and he, or at least he had a dungeon core, or that he, he was the child of a dungeon, or dungeons, uh, but now he kind of knows what he is and how to do things, um, and he can handle himself fairly well. Uh, thankfully, Fred is pretty tough and can recover from most mortal wounds uh, without even having to have somebody give him a Band-Aid. Uh, this book, book yeah, Brooks' book, uh, this book pretty much picks up where the last left off, and it never looks back. Issa and Fred become closer, and I have to say that the clueless love interest bit should not go on much longer than one more book. You know, I think that uh, as of book three, Fred and Issa should either uh, get their feelings under control and, uh, you know, uh, admit them and, and work on them, or give it up. Um, you know, I, I hate to see that sort of thing play out for six or seven novels. I mean, I mean, look at the movie yesterday, just as an example. There's a dude here, and if you haven't seen the movie, it's not, I'm not going to spoil anything, but he's had like 20 years to pull a hookup with this chick that loves him. Totally obvious that she's into him from everything that she does, from the way that she goes and does this for him or that for him, um, and he is completely oblivious. Uh, and he's so stupid that after he, he, he loses her, he does nothing but mope the rest of the movie uh, about the love that had been in his face the whole time. Um, at that point, um, if you weren't interested before, why in the hell is it you suddenly become interested after she says, I'm done waiting? What is it with that? Um, either he had this massive crush, but like when she reveals it to him, it is like a stunning revelation. He had no clue. And at no point did he say, and I felt the same way. No, no, okay? So I, I really am hoping that by book three or four, the whole clueless phase will have vanished, and they'll begin building a relationship together. Uh, so what happens here, though? What, what's more importantly, what goes on in this book? Well, finally, Fred gets to make a dungeon. Um, and it's a pretty night, 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 
pretty cool thing to 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 kind of see as he begins to suss out his real potential. Um, he also comes to realize that making a dungeon may not have been the wisest thing for him to do. Uh, it sort of puts a big bullseye on him, and and other dark dungeons kind of target that bullseye. Uh, and the other dungeons really want him dead. Uh, they basically throw everything they can at him. I mean, I'm talking about cats, kitchen sinks, um, Godzilla monsters, you know. They, they toss everything they can at him to wipe him out and the place where he is he is living. So, you know, if, if you think of, like, you know, characters who are just insane, uh, I, I think that one of my favorite quotes is Greg from The Last Starfighter, where he says, I've always wanted to fight a desperate battle against impossible odds. And, you know, Alex Rogan's kind of like, what the frick is wrong with you? Well, you know, that is not Fred's sentiment, but that's what he has to do. Fred and his people in this town have to fight a desperate battle against incredible odds, impossible odds, unbeatable odds, stacked up unbeatable odds, uh, because the dungeons are coming for him and them. There is no mercy, no quarter, no no chance of survival unless Fred can really, really pull something out of his behind. And we all know he's got like a magical butt that he can pull anything out he wants. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, Fred does everything he can to protect his people in numerous ways. And I don't want to get into it, but the book kind of builds up to, you know, Fred kind of finding out who he is, how to work himself, figure out you know how to do the dungeon thing and then it's it's a, a really big long drawn out battle and when i mean drawn out i mean the battle is lengthy i don't mean it's like one chapter i mean it's a good chunk of the book battle you know and that's that's fine i enjoyed it i, I thought it was really clever um fred does a lot of stuff that you wouldn't expect um you know just like for example uh he, he starts using like triple tripping vines uh, to stop monsters, they're, you know, way beyond just being tripped and hurt, uh, you know, but I have to say, the battle was hella cool, you know, and we get to see Fred at his finest, and the battle was certainly pitched and desperate, but Fred is a stand-up kind of guy, he doesn't back down, he doesn't give up, even when things look tough, he, you know, puts his back to the wall, digs in, and goes forward to do everything he can, you know, that he has to, uh, he just has to do that, uh, and that's like you say, that's one of my favorite things about this book is Fred's character and the other characters are all really interesting people. There are people that if you met them, you'd be like, wow, that was a really cool person to meet and talk to. Um, Miles Miley rocks this town, and I mean he rocks it inside out. Uh, I really enjoy his narration skill here and the way that he is not distracted with the charts or the opposite sex characters. His ladies, granted, may not be Oscar-level quality, but he doesn't sound like Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, it does not sound like that at all. Um, he makes the story fun and brings the characters to, excuse me, to life, which is really all you can ask for. Um, this book, from start to finish, I, I, I listened to it, uh, and I barely put it down. Uh, 8.4 stars. Uh, Fred's story just becomes more interesting and has real bones. Real bones. I, I think that the world building is getting better. I, I think the stakes are getting higher. Uh, and I think the dangers are becoming real and they're looming. And Fred doesn't have a lot of hope, you know, in, in the future. So, uh, you know, I, I personally cannot wait to see what happens next. 8.4 stars. You will not go wrong getting this series. Pick this up. It is just an amazing, amazing series. <laughs> so here, here we go. This one is Dungeon World 3, 3, uh, The Dungeon Core Experience by Jonathan Brooks, narrated by Miles Miley, uh, with a book length of 10 hours and 44 minutes. Just as the sun started to touch the distant horizon, Fred woke up Isa and told her to stop the crystal scorpions. She blinked sleepily, but did as he asked. But Regnark wasn't having any of it. What are you doing? We need to get to the Deadlands as soon as we can. What part of large, fearsome monsters did you not understand? He practically yelled at Fred. Quiet down, I understood you fine. The problem, though, is that it's going to take a lot longer than we thought to get to the Deadlands. I need to start preparing if we're going to survive the night, Fred calmly replied, getting off the back of the scorpion and stretching his legs out. 
He helped Isa down by grabbing her by the waist and lifting her down, and she thanked him for his help. Prepare for what? From what I've heard, there's no preparing against these things. Only some of the highest-rated groups of DAS members have endured a night out here. And not all of them actually survived an encounter with whatever they are. It's suicide to... Don't worry. We're not staying out here. We're staying under there, Fred said, pointing to the ground in front of him. So Fred Winkle Mossering is back and better than ever. This time, he and his companions are on the run from the nature dungeons. Um, and I mean, they're hoofing it. They, they you know, are running for their lives uh, across uh, unknown territories and dangerous lands, uh, trying to escape um, the best way they know how. And you get, a, you get a really good feel for this world as they do so. Um, you know, they're, they're booking across the country looking for the branded and banished people they fought so hard to defend in book two. Uh, Issa deals with her newly minted status better than expected. Uh, and I think it's because her new status is, is probably better than what she was before. Um, plus, we get to see a face from the past of one of Fred's first friends. Uh, they make a reappearance here. Now, one of the best parts of this book is that we get to see more Fred's world. We get some perspective on what's going on. Uh, with the other dungeon, what's happening and what, what they're thinking. And we get to see this world is in a kind of a downward spiral that's eventually going to lead to the extinction of humanity or dungeon humanity. Um, basically, both could also die. You know, so either, you know, humans or dungeons or, or both can pass away. Uh, and yes, I just made up the word dungeon humanity. In my defense, it fits here. Um, Several things to point out. First of all, there's a ton of growth in each of the characters. Uh, and I mean that. There's there's th really three big characters in the book. There's, and I don't want to spoil who the, the third person is, but Isa, Fred, and then the third person who makes a return. Um, they all go through character de development and growth that is necessary. Um, so that is really great to see. You know, and, and I think that Fred really grew in book two. And here in book three, there's even more of that. Um, secondly, we get to see some null mana monsters pop up and give it to the adventuring party. I like the idea behind the creation and execution of them in action. Uh, they were pretty cool monsters, and, you know, you really kind of get to see uh, just how dangerous the world is outside of where Fred has been so far. Additionally, Issa gets some new powers uh, that let her, her kind of rival Fred to a degree. Uh, and she comes to admit her feelings for Fred to a certain extent, um, which was refreshing. Um, Fred struggles to understand his feelings in general. Um, you know, if this was our world, he would be autistic because, you know, he, he, he knows he likes people. He just doesn't understand the ins and outs of, you know, getting them to kind of understand him and him understanding them as well as they should each other. Um... Fred just kind of struggles to understand feelings in general. In some ways, he's a much nicer version, if you ask me, of Boxy Morningwood. Uh, Boxy is almost identical to him um, in many ways. You know, um, they're both very young for, for what they are. Uh, they both are trying to feel their way through, you know, the human way or human society. Uh, they both are more than what they seem. Uh, and the only difference is between... You know, Boxy from Everybody Loves George Chess and Fred is Boxy's a homicidal maniac and Fred does everything he can to protect the people that he's around. Um, but I mean, otherwise, if you, you look at their stories, they're, they're pretty close together on like, you know, the way they do things and, and how they think at least. Um, Fred just had, he's just naive and barely has a clue what's going on around him and, and, until this novel. Um, this novel, he seems to come into his own here, finally. Um, he's definitively more in control of his abilities, and is doing an amazing job getting an understanding of what other cores are, how they work, and how to utilize them. And that's where I say the, the series is really kind of fascinating. Um, I, and I put it in the same category as the Divine Dungeon or Slime Dungeon. The, th the three books in, and Brooks already has one hell of a series on his hand. Um, you know, and, and I'm thinking, like, you know, Divine Dungeon seems to only have so many. Uh, the Slime Dungeon only has so many. Um, and I think Brooks has, like, Core Station has, like, five books, I think. Um, and we're at three on audio now. 
uh, and I know he's finished the, the, the core station, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know how many he has here, but I like that he's got an endpoint in mind. And there is a lot of things happening here, um, you know, that has really raised the stakes. I mean, the stakes are high. You know, I talked earlier in Dungeon Player about how, or not Dungeon Player, was it? Um, yeah, Dungeon Player. There's, there's, there's no... There's no tension. There's no there's no threat hanging over the characters. Here, there is a lot of stuff happening. Uh, you know, for the characters, there's tension, there's sacrifice, there there's dangers. They they do have things happen. Yeah, and, and, and grant you, yes, you know, if if Fred has his head chopped off, he'll regrow a head. So there's not a lot of uh, tension in that kind of aspect. But but there's a lot. I mean, you know, a lot of things that happen that you do have this this build up and this tension where like the dungeons are literally hunting Fred and his people, you know? Um, so, you know, I just have to say, um, the stakes are high and Fred is really dedicated to doing the right thing. Uh, and I think he's, he right now he's, he's having a hard time with the dungeons, uh, because he's been pretty aggressive with the dungeons and he's sided himself basically with humanity but at some point, he's going to have to also say, I'm Dungeon 2. And at that point, he's going to have to kind of equalize things out for everybody and make it where it's all fair and fun for both both parties. Um, and, and I have one question I have to ask, and, and I don't know if, if Jonathan Brooks will answer this or not, or if he even listens to this sort of thing. Um, but if, if Fred's parents were both cores, what's the deal with his human body? Um, why is he a hybrid? How is he a hybrid? I mean, did his folks build the, the human body for him? Uh, did they just use a corpse uh, that had been laying around? Was there a sacrifice that gave Fred his humanity? That by that, I mean, like, did a human guy come up and say, look, if you provide this for my family, like unlimited riches for them, I'll give you my body, and your your son can have it for his, his shell, so to speak? I mean, you just have to wonder, because if Fred wasn't housed in a meat shell... He would never be able to do what he plans on doing, ever. Um, and the the human body gives him a unique power that no other dungeons have. Uh, and, I, and, you know, I would say mobility, but that's not quite it. He has a whole different perspective on what the dungeons are and what people are and how they should interact and, and do things. And it's it's just exciting to see how well you know he works with that that human side of himself even though he's really a dungeon at heart uh you know that's one of the things that i think that uh, it kind of gets glossed over a little bit fred has a human body but he's really 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 a dungeon down deep um you know so just something to, th uh, to, to bear in mind um at the end of the book we come to a special place uh, where there are rules and regulations for all the dungeons to follow. Uh, you know, their dungeons aren't allowed within a certain radius, they're not allowed to build a dungeon there, and so on and so forth. And, of course, if you know Fred, he kind of breaks all the rules and has, has things happening, but it's a really, really fun way to do it. And, and I have to say, uh, Brooks just has such a winner here on his hands. This is an intensely great series. I love this series. It is one of my favorite dungeon books of all time, uh, and, and it just gets better and better. Like book one was great, book two was fantastic. This one is amazing, uh, and I can't speak more highly of it than what I do right now. Final score: eight point five stars. Brooks has built up an interesting cast of characters, flipped things around so the cores are not only the dungeon types out there anymore, um, because there's stuff going on with Isa and some other people in the area of Fred uh, that is completely new and unexpected. The world building that he's doing is incredibly impressive and complex, and it makes me want to see more of what comes next. I think that this is Brooks' best series by far, bar none, no questions about it. I am all in 100% with this series. So, you know, if you really like Dungeons, this is a series for you. Get book one, get book two, book three. Uh, and like I say, Miles Miley just nails the narration. He 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 um, he gets everything that Brooks lays down. You know, he he knows the jokes. He gets the the, the pacing. The pro he has it. He has it all in hand. And and that's where I say, um, I just wish he would do all the series because he is just really great 
for Brooks's uh, stuff. Just he he just totally gets it. So eight point five stars. Uh, this one I'm going to do is Dungeon Player, a lit RPG Dungeon Core adventure. Uh, Glendary Awakens Trilogy. This is book one. Uh, again, like I say, by Jonathan Brooks, narrated by Sarah L. Colton, uh, with a book length of three hours and 48 minutes. Which race are you going to choose? Devin asked. Come on. You know we've been over and over what we're going to select for months now. Krista whined. Ever since launch, you've spent hours and hours poring over the forums, looking at the pros and cons of each race, class, and profession. Although, I have to admit that I spent most of those hours with him, poring over the same information. I'm pretty sure we decided last week what we should do when we'd finally get the chance to play. Sorry, it's just that the time has finally come, and I'm forgetful and nervous and excited and... And forgetful and... You're silly, she laughed before asking. Anyways, how do we get started? It's funny, I read all about the game, but I didn't pay attention to how these pods work. So, I do believe that this was Brooks' first novel. I mean, you can really kind of get a feel, uh, feel for that fact as he does things here that he doesn't do in later books. The novel is fairly short, and I can appreciate the short story aspect. I'm always looking for new short stories. Uh, I have no issue with the length of the book. Um, I don't know if I was, if I was buying the novel, because I, I don't know what the cost of the book is, but I mean, that might be a factor if I was literally buying the, the Kindle edition where I would say, okay, it's only like 190 pages. Is it worth six bucks? I, guess I don't know what it sells for. Um, I have to even wonder that um, for novelized. But, you know, for here, it's, it's, it's a pretty good price. I think it's a good deal. Um, and I think that uh, even though it's the first book, it's a good stepping stone into uh, insight on how he, he has built up his, his world because he has some amazing series out there. Um, that said, I think the book for its length is really stat heavy. Um, it was like I was always just getting into the flow of the book when we get into like a ton of these numbers. And I, I have to say, I know that like Brooks pretty much comes out and says, at the beginning of any of his books, uh, well, you know, I like to share information. I like to give as much information as I can to the listener. And, I, 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 you know, I like to keep things crunchy. And that's fantastic. I appreciate that uh, because there's nothing I hate more than having things withheld or, you know, being obscured for no real reason. Um, you know, so it's, I'm, I'm very appreciative that he's eager to share his information on like how the world works, and then there's nothing kept from the reader or listener. More importantly, he brings, and here's what I'm going to say this, as much as it, you know, there's a bit of a flow issue, he brings some really cool new ideas to the genre. Um, here, his MCs are fun and interesting, but I did have a few issues. Like first, the new author vibe kind of kicks in where there seems to be no real stakes or tensions for the character. Uh, I mean, like, literally, there's nothing that happens where I say, oh my god, um, something horrible is going to occur. Uh, one of them is going to, to you know, be obliterated or something like that. That, that never really comes up. Um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no penalties, no losses, no consequences. Um, you know, the, the MCs, Devin and Krista, have to endure the game, you know, the game world, and they never have anything happen. For example, in most books, if the MC dies, there's XP loss, and I'll be honest, um, just as an example in my own personal life about ex experience points of loss, um, I hate XP loss from death in video games. I hate it. Um, I can remember playing EverQuest. So when it first came out, I played EverQuest. And I always play solo because I hate teaming up with other people. I am not a cooperative player. I'm not a team player. I'm a solo guy. 90% of the time, if I play, I play by myself. There was a few times I tried to play WoW with my wife, um, but we just did not work. My wife is an extreme healer. That's what she does. She's a massive healer. She's, she's been in massive guilds that have praised her and said how great a healer she is. Uh, she knows what she's doing. Um, she is a cooperative and uh, impressive individual for those sort of things. Me, I solo everything. Does that mean that I do great? Nope. Do I usually break past 20, level 25 in a video game? No, no, I really don't. Uh, because those games are made to be cooperative. You're made to go out and get gear and do raids. I don't do that because why? 
involves other human beings and playing with them. And I don't like to do that. I like to just do things on my own. Um, City of Heroes. I, that was one of those ones where I, I played r ridiculous amounts of time uh, all by myself. And I think I probably teamed up two or three times just because I had nothing better to do with time. And I thought, okay, hell, I'll do this. Um, but in, in EverQuest, see, I digress. Uh, as as Lil Jackson likes to put that I digress. Well, he doesn't say I digress. Uh, I say I digress. But anyway, I digress. Um, EverQuest, I can remember I got into an area and I was playing a druid and I built him up to like level 17. And the area I got to, um, there was just this one, it was a giant, I do believe. There was a tower and I was trying to get to the tower to hide until we finally had the aggro wear off and he could get away. And I can remember sitting there getting drunk because I was just trying to pass time. And after I thought he was gone, I came outside and I was sober at that point. Uh, and I still got clobbered. I got pounded. And every time I tried to go back to get gear or, you know, do finish up, I would get killed over and over and over again until I finally escaped with my stuff. And I was level 12 by that point. And at that point, I just said it was it was hard to, to regrind those levels. Um, and it just pissed me off something so fierce uh, that I just said, hell with it, I'm done with the game. I literally logged in like the next day and was like, anybody want any of this gear for if you newbie, newbie, new trees, let me know. I've got stuff for you. And I gave away everything that wasn't like bound to my character. Uh, my money, my gold, my magic, whatever it was, I gave it away and I walked away. I quit. So I, I get that if I'm writing a book, I might take into consideration uh, and make it where... Um, if somebody dies, they don't have XP loss or, or something, but there's no tension in this book to kind of make you really go, oh, I can't believe that this happened. What are they going to do? Um, and, and at least not until the very, very, very end of the novel. Um, so it's kind of, kind of like a, yeah, it's interesting, but this is kind of, um, there's a loss here somewhere. Um, one thing I was kind of surprised to see was, and I really enjoyed this aspect, was, you know, the characters have the ability to shift anything they want to about themselves, you know, if, if they got killed. So, you know, you don't like being an elf, meh, swap over being human. Easy breezy, you know, lemon squeezy, tired of being a cleric and having to pray all day, pick up a knife and stand in the shadows, a boop, now you're rogue. That was pretty cool. My big problem was Colton's narration is sort of middle of the road. Um, she tries one voices, but her male voices are weak. We click all of oil from Popeye week. I mean, just there's no muscle there at all. There's no nothing. Um, after listening to Colton and Coxy, and I'll tell you about Coxy later, I just come to the conclusion that Brooks is better served keeping Miles uh, Miley on as his signature narrator. Uh, and I'll talk about Miles here on a couple other books. Uh, I think Miles just does a fantastic job, but uh, Colton and Coxy, uh, they just. They are not inspiring me to go back, and, and I'm kind of shocked because uh, I think Colton also does the core of horror book, and I've been dying to get that book and listen to it, and if she is the narrator, it's going to be hard for me. I'm really hoping she brings her A-game because she kind of like just drew this book down more than it should have. Um, it, just, it was not as fun as it could have been with her there, and again, I, books are made or broken by their, their narrators, and she broke this one pretty good. Uh, it was just kind of middle road stuff. And I think the story was better than the narration. And that caused issues. Because if you have a story that's better than the narration, uh, you have a mediocre story. You, you know, there's nothing about it. Um, but this was a good starting point for Brooks. This is where he made his mark on the dungeon genre. Um, and, his, and I think that it was actually, even though it was his first book, um, it wasn't his first release. I think he did Station Court first. And if I'm wrong on that, Jonathan, you can correct me, but um, this was definitely his first written novel. I think he went back and released it afterwards just to say, hey, look, here's one of the novels I did. I hope you guys like it. Um, which I, I think that if I was just reading the book, I would probably enjoy it much more than what I did listening to it. Um, so for me, this is probably his weakest novel in all the books he's done so far in terms of plot progression and character adversity. There's a lot of setup here, a lot of stats. So I can see this becoming a decent series in the future. 
Um, I just, I just hope he, he you know, I, I just talked about like how loyal the audiobook listeners are to their narrators. But they have to be good, great, fantastic, amazing, blow your mind kind of narrators. Um, because sometimes switching over is a step up. And Miles Miley, I think, would probably do a lot better just carrying all your books, Jonathan. Um, for, so for me, this is like a final score of 7.7. .7. Uh, like I say, it's the weakest of the, of the books because it's a lot of, of flow issues with the stats and the story and then the narration. So as interesting as it was, and there were some really cool concepts, I have to say uh, it was a good try, and I still think it was a good book. Uh, and it was probably a better book than it is an audio book. Okay, so 7.7 7 stars. Okay, so the next book I'm going is Crafter's Dungeon, a dungeon core novel uh, of dungeon crafting by Jonathan Brooks, uh, narrated by Louise Cosi. Uh, this is a book length of 9 hours and 59 minutes. Every one of their transport vehicles had more than adequate supplies to help with any type of accident. There was even an ultra-expensive, high-quality health potion in each box, which would heal and fix almost any non-fatal injury. Her father's paranoia about wounds did come in handy sometimes. Though, handy wasn't quite the word either of them would normally use. Born with a defect in both of her hands that made them practically deformed, Sandra had difficulty gripping, squeezing, and holding anything heavier than the knife she had fumbled earlier, and moving her fingers in any complicated motions was next to impossible. In fact, they were shaped more like monster claws than normal hands and had an almost permanent curl to them. However, after 26 years of living with it, she could manage most common things with a little effort. After spreading a little low-grade healing ointment on her scrape from an easy-to-open jar, she wound a small, clean bandage around it and secured it into place with a simple tie. So I, I think it's fair by this point that I can say I'm a Brooks fan. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I'm probably doing these in weird orders or something like this, uh, just to kind of keep things mixed up. But um, I'm just going to come out and say Miles Miley should do all his books, okay? I've, I've said this in other, other reviews, and I, I'm sticking by this. Um, Miles Miley gets the humor and pacing that Bruce lays out. He does a decent job on the voicings of the opposite sex. Cosi, however, cannot touch him. Um, at best, she does a serviceable job, and at worst, a barely passable one. There were numerous points where I found her to just not be monotone, but almost droning, um, and I especially hated that when it came to doing the stats, because it was kind of like listening to, uh, you know, Ferris Bueller's teacher, um, you know, Bueller, Bueller, anyone, anyone. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Uh, it was a tedious process sometimes. She forced me to literally put the book down multiple times, uh, or just go do something else for a little while. Uh, she made it, it made it difficult for me to get into the flow of the story, and I constantly found myself wishing that Miles had been handed the reins. So she is kind of like, you know, Brooks is a drag racer. She is a parachute that blows too soon. I mean, he's already trying to build up speed, and she's already full blown, blown out and holding back. Uh, and I, I, I'm trying not to be mean about it. But I'm going to be honest, it was, it was a chore to get through her narration, much more so than um, the, the book, uh, The Dungeon Player, because at least there, um, Colton tried really hard and, and did do some things. But here is kind of like, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, she just did not grip me with the story. I don't know if she didn't understand the story. Or if the, the stats were just like a chore for her to do, but it sure felt like a chore to me, and and that is where you, you kind of lose yourself. Uh, but again, I'm going to say this: I really think Brooks knows the dungeon genre really well. Clearly, this man is a fan of the dungeon books. He he is familiar with every aspect of the genre, and he is coming up with new and innovative ways to um, you know elevate the genre to to 
you know, bigger, bigger things. things. Uh, you, you know, know it's, it's not just it's not just Jeffrey Falcon Logue and it's not just Dakota Kraut having these books out here. Uh, you know, there are other people that have written dungeon books, but I mean, if you look at it, Brooks has blown the lid off in terms of cranking out these books quickly. Um, and the story here itself is pretty interesting. The MC dies that wakes up as a dungeon core, which is a standard MO for dungeon books. Uh, but where the story deviates in a good way is that the dungeon's purpose is what, what it is. What, the, what is the dungeon's purpose? And how it goes about taking care of business. Now, two things to pick at, which is what I kind of do. The book is a little slow to start, although my perception of that may be due to Kosi's or Kosi's uh, narration. Uh, it just seemed like it took some time to get started. And again, uh, I can say that with like me having to, I started, I stopped, I started, I stopped, I started, I stopped. Started, I started, I stopped. Um, that could have been just because of, of her narration, but I think it, it was a little slow. Story-wise, uh, but once it got going, there, the, you know, it, it wasn't bad. But there's not a lot of interaction as the story deals with really the dungeon and a, a, a dwarf. You know, um, you know, the MC Sandra has a pretty cool background, and she has an artistic spirit. She wants to create things. Like, you know, when she was alive, but she had janky hands and couldn't, and now she has an opportunity to create. Anything she, you know, she wants, like she's always had, she had this dream to do. Her dungeon was pretty much created to balance out the other types of dungeons, which are basically just homicidal monsters that make Godzilla look like a toddler throwing a tantrum. Uh, the crafting and the progression are fun, and her experience, and, and, but the, I don't want to murder all the people in the dungeon. Uh, it also made it different, but a little weird. I mean, the dungeon's got to eat, you know, and there, there has to be some sort of... Yeah, I think I can get away with a couple of these guys here and there. Um, the one thing that really threw me off, though, of everything, was that as much as Sandra wants to create and do neat new things, I, I think that she. one of the bad parts is, is if I'm remembering correctly, she, she could not create monsters on her own. They were already like prefab monsters. Um, and as somebody who wants to craft and do things, uh, if I remember this correctly, um, it was just kind of weird that she wouldn't have the opportunity to create new life forms, you know, like, like just say, for example, cow does in the Divine Dungeon. You know, you take money, you take, you know, a snake, and you uh, mash them up and you come out with a bake, you know, uh, a buck. I don't know. Anyway, anyway the Buke, uh, you know, he, he, he had, had no problem doing that sort of stuff, and she doesn't get to do it, and it was just kind of weird. Um, the, the book is, as usual, for Brooks, full of bloody, crunchy stats and progression, and he fills this book with tons of info. The book, for the most part, is mostly set up for the rest of the series, or at least so it seems to me. Uh, I think that, you know, this is, uh, this is like one of these books where you say, okay, I have a lot that I want to do, but I have to give you this, I don't want to call it an info dump, but I'm going to have to give you all this information so that it all makes sense later on. And that, that kind of has that feel. I mean, the minutia that is here is essentially a framework laid for a larger story coming down the line. And again, the reason I feel like this is that for the majority of books, there's not a lot of the dialogue. Uh, and I think we get to well after the halfway point, maybe even further than that, before the dungeon really starts having guests and talking occurs and things like that, um, I, I think you have to have something there in order to, you know, bounce, you know, even if, if she had talked to herself, it may not have been as bad. Um, but, you know, you, you go a long way before there's even the dialogue. So, uh, you know, it just, it just, it was all set up and built up for what was to come later. And part of it was paid off at the end of the book, but... I, I think, think it's, it's going to go further, further into the next next, next issue, issue next, next next novel. So I think that Brooks kind of has this all done at this point. Now he can focus on the story, and that'll be nice. I, I would love to see that. But again, if Cozy is, is reading, I don't know if I will. Um, excuse me. I, I know that I enjoyed this story. I thought it was really neat. But but I mean, the narration by Cozy just kind of. Oh, it just stuck me really the wrong way. I mean, I had to keep stopping and going. Um, 
anyway, anyway you know, um, a pacifistic, pacifistic dungeon core is a pretty new concept, and, and the struggle to make traps that don't, don't kill is pretty novel, it's pretty cool. Uh, so, so there's a lot of stuff happening here, and I think Brooks has a good solid foundation uh, for a view of skew type of series. Uh, and now that that's all laid out, I can't wait to see what happens next. Again, unless if you can get someone else to do this. Um, one last thing is not to be the dead horse, but I've talked about the differences between sentient and sapient before. Um, so he may want to go back and look that up uh, because that is one of my sticking points. Is sentient is not the word you mean to use. Sapient is. Um, so maybe just look that up a little bit. Because uh, that, that's one of my crazy points. Um, that and end signs. Uh, anyway, good start to a promising series that gets weighted down by minimalistic narration. Here, my final score is going to be 7.7 .7 stars. And I know this, oddly enough, is probably one of his more popular uh, novels. I know everybody that I've, I've talked to about this novel has said they really loved it. It was a great read. They enjoyed it. And therein lies the rub. That's why I do this show and Ramon does the other one because Ramon is doing the reading and I'm doing the listening. And sometimes the two do not meet even though they should. There should never be a point where he says this book was a 5 and I say it was a 10. And I should never say this book was a, uh, a 10 and he says it was a 5. Um, I mean, we'll have differences on like, how high we go with something, but a good book is a good book is a good book. Um, and I know, you know, and 7.7 is not bad by any stretch, um, but it was probably way better, probably way better, would have had a way better score, um, but the narration just kind of killed it for me. Uh, it bogged it down. It just bogged this story down so much. So I apologize. And I, I mean, no disrespect to Coxie. I, I just don't think that um, this is her bag, so to speak. Uh, and I don't know where she fits in narration-wise, but this is not it. Uh, she just did not work well for me here. I'm sorry. But there you go. 7.7 7 stars. Okay. okay. So, so the next, next book I'm going is not by Jonathan, Jonathan Ross. Ross. Uh, it is Dungeon Traveler by Alston Sleet. Uh, narrated by Doug Teasdale Jr. With a book length, length of 9 hours and 17 minutes. minutes. Death is unpleasant. That's probably no surprise to anyone. After all, not many people want to be dead. When I say that death is unpleasant, I don't mean the process of becoming dead. No, I mean being dead. Not that the process was much better. It was relatively quick for me, but it still wasn't a slice of cake. It actually involved cake since the truck was a bakery delivery truck rushing to a wedding, but I never got a slice and what I ate was more asphalt and sidewalk than delightful icing. I can't even claim some kind of noble act of bravery rushing forward to save some child's life. No, I was playing on my phone while walking home from the pub after a few too many drinks over the weekend. A midday drinking binge, an untucked shirt covering my belly lapping over my too tight belt, hair disarrayed since I didn't have a wife or other to direct me to get it cut, a quick squint at the screen while walking through the crosswalk, and... Splat. In a genre that seems to be inundated with numerous books uh, that simply repeat the cycle of become a dungeon, bring in adventurers, kill them, and repeat, it becomes harder and harder to stand out. Um, dungeon Traveler manages to stand out in an excellent way, uh, in a clever way, and in a smooth way. Um, instead of just being a dungeon, it... it is not located in one place, it travels instead. This is, of course, why it's called Dungeon Traveler, although I want to think from the, the context of the name of this, the novel, you would think the Dungeon Traveler was about somebody who went from dungeon to dungeon, not the dungeon going to other places. And that is where uh, all the fun kind of kicks in. Um, the dungeon uh, pops in place into existence for a little unspecified amount of time, and, and then, then moves on. on. Basically, it goes from race to race, race rather than just, just place to place. Uh, the dungeon learns from each encounter, and it is very fair in dealing with its guests. Um, it's not just a homicidal murder machine. Um, it, it, it it does kill people, but it does it at, at their own stupidity. And if they do it, 
they deserve it. Um, the setup is pretty typical. A guy from our world dies, mm -hmm, sound familiar, uh, and he wakes up in a strange place, sound familiar, but this time he's a core. Um, he's already there, he doesn't have an idea of what happened, how he got to be the way he is. Um, all he knows is that he's kind of stuck in this one room. Uh, he doesn't have much time because the people who made him have some nefarious purposes in mind for him, so he, he um, manages to pull an escape and then takes his time to catch his breath uh, and learn exactly what he is and what he's meant to do. And here I'm going to say, the MC is actually very fun. I really love this book a lot. I, I think it has some genuine moments to it, uh, very deep moments. And it does its best to detail what it is each race is like as they enter the dungeon. So, you know, their unique ways of dealing with the dungeon come across, uh, their reactions come across, and so on and so forth. Um, when I, mean, I think out of all of them, the, the keyboards are my favorite. Um, I just totally love them with the pieces, the way that they, they did things. Um, the entire premise is unique. It makes this... Makes this a chunk of gold amongst Iron Pyrite. Uh, there is an overarching plot that kind of deals with gods and politics and other such things. But for me, just getting to see the, the way the dungeon reacts to each encounter was fun. Uh, remember, this isn't his world, and so he's learning about it at the same rate we are. You know, we're kind of in this together, the dungeon and you and I. Uh, also, there's a lot of stuff here to keep the crunchers happy. As the MC kind of advances uh, with notifications and pop-ups throughout, uh, personally, I love to hear the non euclidean geometry is being used uh, as it kind of harkens back to my extreme love of all things HP Lovecraft. Uh, now, Doug Teasdale Jr. does, uh, you know, he does a really good job. Um, he's very familiar with lit RPG and dungeons, having worked with people like Eric Oster and Skylar Grant, on more than just a few of his books, so, you know, he, he knows the genre really well. Um, if you really like his work, if you, if you really like, you know, Doug Teasdale Jr., what I will suggest is that you, you try a book called Orconomics. Uh, it is funny as hell, and he really shines in this novel. Um, in Traveler, Teasdale is in top form, and he plays every role with great aplomb. Uh, just, he just has fun here, and... That's, That's what the story, story dictates. dictates. He, he should. should. He, he should just have fun. fun. Uh, for, for example, example there's, there's a scene where Cautious Keyboard uh, like literally uh, licks the floor, and the, the core is stunned and, and amused and curious, curious. all at the same time. time. All at the same time. time. And Tisto manages to sound that way all at once. All at once. Uh, I think the only hurdle that I heard him catch himself on, and I have to call him out, is, is that the world system um, is described as having a matronly or a motherly voice, and he does not go near it with that kind of a voice. You know, a motherly voice or a matronly voice is um, very comforting, very concerned, very, very you know, helpful. So when the, the, the system pops up, it, it should be like, I'd just like to help out. How can I do this? How can I make you feel better? What can I do for you? And you don't have that. Um, but, you know, I, I will say, honestly, I don't know if he just didn't feel like he couldn't pull that off, if he didn't have that in him, so he stayed away from it, or if he just didn't, didn't notice it and he just skipped that part as he, like, as he was going through. Um, you know, so whether he thought he couldn't pull it off or he missed the aspect, I don't know. But at least he didn't try to make a southerner sound British, uh, you know, like I've heard other narrators do, uh, limitlessly, as I keep thinking about, you know, with that. Uh, anyway, um, the series is a, a unique take. It's, it's got a lot of great characterization. Um, the book is, how I put this, it, it's not super long. It's nine hours. So, you know, you can sit through it in one listening if you really want to. Uh, it's enjoyable. I, I really recommend this book. Um, I want to say 8.3 stars. Uh, it's a good first book. It's a promising series. I just can't wait to see what happens next. And I think you will, too. I, I think that uh, this has been um, a, a really good, fun novel, and it stands alone just in the fact that it does something unique. And, again, that's the whole key now that we have this is what the genre consists of, and this is what we all do, and now we can't do any of those things. We have to be 
be smarter and better and take care of things. And Brooke, Brooks, you know, himself, um, when he's doing his books, you know, he does that too. He, he does a lot of unique things, you know, that, that you don't see coming, like Fred Winkle Mossering being a dungeon that walks around. That's unique. Here, the dungeon doesn't walk around. It just kind of says, whoop, and reappears somewhere else. And that works. It works really, really well. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think that, you know, 8.3 stars, I just really want to get the next book and see how it goes. Uh, Sleet really does work well with this. So 8.3 stars. All right, so next up is Station Core, a Dungeon Core epic uh, by Jonathan Brooks, yet again, narrated by Miles Miley in a book length of 9 hours and 38 minutes. He had become adept at battlefield logistics in his previous incarnation as a top-tier gamer, but he never had to worry about finding where the food came from. As long as he had the requisite gold or resources, he'd be able to buy enough to outfit his units. The town-building games he had played in the past allowed the creation of sources of food, but it was more of a point-and-click construction, and then it would be up and running after a short period of time. He was going to have to learn more about sustaining his combat units in the future so that they wouldn't drop dead of starvation when he needed them the most. Despite the starvation and near-starvation of his snakes, as well as the well-fed jackalopes, his frontline defenders did an excellent job of protecting the entrance tunnel. In fact, the only thing that got past them was a small dog-like animal, which was about the size of a dachshund, but with the quickness of a greyhound. Speeding past their swift strikes without harm, the... He was going to call it a grey wiener, a combination of a greyhound and a dachshund, or wiener dog. So, Brooks kind of popped up with the release of this book. I mean, he kind of just said, here I am, um... And I took notice right away. It sounded like it was a really good story. And I find it funny how many people thought that he had like this giant squirrel in the story based on the cover. I can remember when the cover first popped up, people were like, he's got a giant squirrel? Uh, and that's not, not the case at all. Um, I also get the joke about the bloodthirsty squirrels. Uh, totally. I totally get it, Jonathan. I don't know if, it's, if you really have lived this hour or not. But I have lived this, the, the tale of being attacked by a squirrel. I mean, way back in college, um, I was feeding the squirrel peanuts, and when I ran out, the little monster ravaged my hand, uh, giving me a lifelong vendetta against those furry little buggers. Uh, so I totally get where Milton comes from on that topic, because they are vicious, they are rodents, uh, and they will eat anything, and, including you in your hand if you don't have peanuts. And I want to make sure I said peanuts, and you understood that I was talking about peanuts, and that's what I was giving this squirrel. Uh, because, just because. So here again, um, here's where we have a guy, and this is like one of the typical, typical tropes. Uh, he gets snatched and taken to a strange area, only to find out he has been volunteered uh, to have become a station corps, and in order to help a race that is kind of hyper-advanced but has no aggressive instincts whatsoever. He wakes up, only to find himself severely damaged and on a strange world for millennia in the future. For him, there is no going back. Quite simply, that's it. He's got no body. He's got no family. He's got nobody at all. Uh, there's nothing he can do except survive and hopefully escape this planet. Uh, thankfully, he has a cutie patootie mass of nanites who kind of help him as he kind of figures out how to survive in a hostile world. Uh, Milton, now Milton is, is he's an interesting dude, okay? Um, who seems to kind of settle into being a, a core pretty quickly and easily. And I do have a few nits to pick, uh, but they're not that big a deal. First, Milton's companion uh, is from the Collective, and she swears all the time, like a sailor who's on leave who finds himself in a two-dollar whorehouse with 50 cents to his name. That kind of swearing mad. Okay, um, personally, I don't care. I mean, I'm a person who loves to string along a massive web of obscenities uh, and, and just shatter swear jars with a look. Uh, because I love to swear, I love to cuss, I love to curse. Uh, those are things in life that make me happy. Uh, you know, so I will just walk around and just, when there's no one nearby, I let them fly, just because I like the way they sound. Uh, I almost could be considered to have Tourette's, okay? But not quite there yet. Anyway, um, it would have been a great book for my kids, except for the swearing. Now, again, I don't mind the swearing for kids. 
kids hear it, they hear it in school, they say it in school. I'm not overwhelmed by the swearing aspects, but my wife does care. Um, she does mind, and so they missed out on a really good book. Secondly, one thing I'm going to say is Milton was chosen for his gaming skills, and yet he has trouble conceptualizing just simple traps. Um, he, he struggles to have ideas to come up with some really good ones. I mean, eventually he does come up with some really cool ideas. Um, but it's not just the traps. I mean, there's a couple of things I'm like, he could figure out to keep invaders out of his, his I don't want to call it a dungeon, but, you know, his dungeon. Um, either he's not as good as collective thought he was, or he suffered some serious brain damage in the transfer. Because I'm not amazed by his, his gaming powers being applied here on this world. Um, there's things he does that are pretty smart, but again, it has nothing to do with his gaming techniques. Otherwise, uh, the progression of him dealing with the intrusions works out pretty well. I especially like the way that Brooks um, holds off on just letting Milton kind of combine creatures together for some cool hybrids, uh, and then he is size limited on what he can make. So, you know, if it was me, I would just lose my mind. Like, okay, he's got our DNA recombiner. Um, he's going to do this, 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 and this. He's going to take this and make these monsters. Um, and he, he doesn't do it because he can't just make giant monsters or, or human-sized monsters willy-nilly because he has to have specific things that aren't built yet. Um, so, you know, the other thing is, is we also get to see that Milton's presence, whether he wants it to or not, has had a massive impact on the environment in some, some seriously major ways, uh, especially with the locals. Uh, you know, the locals, the natives, uh, the, uh, the Aboriginal people, whatever you want to call them there, uh, they kind of have stuff happen to them just because Milton exists. Um, and the locals are interesting. Uh, and like I say, Milton's Im uh, impact on the environment is massive. Uh, we only get to see a small portion of the world that Milton finds himself in and maintains, but it keeps your interest and sets up a bigger story for the future. So here, what is the book about? The book is about this guy, Milton, trying to figure out where he's at, what's going on, how he can repair himself and get the hell off the planet before he's destroyed. Uh, and then he go out and look to see what happened to the collective. Now, you know, obviously this is book one and it's not leaping ahead in massive, you know, jump, jump, jump in time. Uh, even though he does sleep a little bit here or there, I never once felt like if he slept for a hundred years that we missed out on something because even though it comes back and says, well, I defended my lair about 12 times, so I got like 12 points of experience, so, you know, I leveled up a little bit here or there. It doesn't feel like I've been robbed, and usually that is the case. Usually I say, I've been robbed, I've been missing something, uh, there is more to the story, and it was taken away from me just so they can jump through time. Here, I didn't feel like that at all. I, you know, I didn't need to see him killing snakes, you know, the lollipop snakes or, or you know, something. And that, that's one of the other things I get. Like, you know, Brooks has this, this, this good sense of humor. Um, where, you know, the Milton kind of just names things as he sees them. So the snake that I'm talking about, it looks like a lollipop because it's got a great big head and it's got a thin body. It's a lollipop. They become lollipop snakes. They, you know, he gives those things their names. Uh, and, and that's throughout the whole book, like quick lizards or quizzers and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff that I think this, it really sells really well. Um, and it's, it's just enjoyable. Uh, he does get to meet uh, a native named Brent, and they kind of coordinate things together. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good, good story. Uh, Miles Miley does an outstanding job here, and I wish that Brooks used him on all his books. And I probably said that three or four times by this point. Um, you probably heard me say that. But Miles just really goes well with the writing and gets where Brooks is going. Um, he is humorous and serious depending on what's called for, and he sells the tale. That's the most important thing. He sells it. Um, you, you don't walk away thinking that he didn't care or that it, it just he's just punching in and punching out. He cares about the world. He cares about the characters. Um, and he fits the live RPG style very nicely. So I give him a ton of credit. Miley is just, he's worth it. Uh, and, and I wish that, you know, like I say, Brooks would just employ him to get his books done because everything he does is fun and exciting in my eyes. Um, the final score is going to be 8.3 stars. 
Uh, this begins to build up some steam and it's chugging along beautifully. I really do want to know where Brooks gets his ideas because he's quickly claiming a big stake in the live RPG genre. Uh, the man is a powerhouse for these dungeon novels. Uh, and it kind of scares me, I'm like, what else he can do? Because if he's this good with the dungeon stuff, if he does, like, you know, a portal world, like, you know, like, like say, Delvers, or he, he tries to do, like, a, a full-on, full-version game, like, like, um, Radiant Gate, he, he's gonna just, he's gonna just own the entire, entire genre. Uh, because the man does do some really good writing, um, and I think, like, between this series, the Station Core, and the, the Dungeon World, uh, it just works. It just it just works so well. So I think he's found his pace finally. Uh, and again, I haven't read the core four, and I haven't read um, you know well, I've read the other like the dungeon player and, and other stuff. Um, but the crafter's dungeon uh, it, it just did not work as well for me as these two books, like the the station core and dungeon world, are just fantastically phenomenal. And I think crafter's dungeon would probably be really great. But I just can't get into the narration, so I don't know. Um, but I think that Brooks is a major player. I think that he doesn't want to get the credit he deserves. I think that uh, he is a standout in this genre, and he he is really, really um, taking the field by force. Uh, you know, he is he is William Wallace. You know, running across the field, uh, cutting off ladies' arms, and owning that field. Because uh, he is fearless, and he's doing a great job with these books. So I really do enjoy the Station Core, um, and I enjoy the Dungeon World more than anything else he's done so far. And again, I've enjoyed his other books too. So final score is 8.3. So, again, here we go, Jonathan Brooks. Uh, the Quizard Mountains by Jonathan Brooks. Narrated by Miles Miley, with the book length of 10 hours and 2 minutes. Fortunately, the four intruders were still hours away from finding his dungeon. That gave Milton time to panic, have a temporary mental breakdown, and then pull himself together as he assessed the current state of the dungeon. While he had been farming, Wisp and Brent had been hard at work building the first room near the entrance, just past the doorway containing the monomel wire grid trap. After Milton had told her that his drones could understand and follow blueprints, she made them as detailed as possible so that Brent wouldn't have to relay every piece of it. All it took was Brent staring at it while concentrating on delivering orders to the dozen drones still available to them. Within a couple of seconds, they had the plan and were ready to go. Since Milton had a reasonably good tactical map of the underground area around his core due to searching for ore deposits, Wisp was able to sketch out a bare-bones representation of the final configuration of rooms according to the available space. It followed the general path of his original tunnel, but it expanded it significantly as well. So, Milton and Company return with a new addition to their exclusive club. Wisp, who is Brent's love interest from book one, uh, manages to make her way to... Uh, Milton's home. Uh, and I love that Brooks managed to slip the word Wisp into a sci-fi Dungeon Core novel uh, just because, you know, Will the Wisp and Divine Dungeon, I think it was really, really slick and smooth and I give him a lot of credit for that. And I really love that kind of stuff. It's just like one of those little snippets, it's a little Easter egg, it's, it's just a little amuse-bouche to make this much better. Um, and I, I give him credit because it's just fun for me to see that sort of stuff. Now this time, the gang is trying to endure forays from the Cord Power Company, the makers of those power potions that everybody loves to drink, uh, you know, back in the native's place, uh, as they seek out the people who are responsible for brewing the better batch of potion that they can ever hope to make. Who just happens to be those people? Why, Brent and Wisp and Milton and, you get it, uh, they're taking his old skunk water and drinking that stuff because it's super juiced up. Uh, and so they're kind of not happy and they're looking for the source as well as a couple other things. I don't want to give away. Um, this time around, Milton is making the hybrid monsters, cloning, and learning powers uh, from the natives because they, they have a 
this superpower ability too, uh, due to him, and I'm not spoiling anything that's covered in book one, uh, you know, as he continues to search for rare metal. So, you know, Milton is, is doing a lot of stuff at the same time he's also mining. And it's, it's kind of reminiscent of like Cal from The Mine Dungeon, where he'll have this going on, but at the same time, he'll be paying attention over here, building elementals or, you know, making a wolf man or something like that. Um, so he can do multiple tasks at once. He multitasks. And it, it just kind of works really, really well. You know, so I, I really think that, um, you know, it, it, the story starts to feel like a dungeon core more than anything else at, at this point. Um, because he begins to improve his lair with things like special materials, like Wavetium, uh, which is like a super dense type of stone, new monsters, new drones. Um, he's beginning to kind of come into his own as a dungeon or a station core. Um, and I think it, it, it is smooth and fun the way he does this. The story is well paced. It unfolds in unexpected ways. Brent and Wisp work well together and actually grow now that they are removed from their societal constraints. Um, the Neonite uh, Cloud Collective Helper, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, and I'm sorry about that. Um, she begins to show um, signs of having like a dissociative identity disorder. I don't know how to put it in the way. As she sort of, sort of cycles through various bits of personality, uh, now that she's coming into... Um, contact or encountering females um, from whom she can model herself. Uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's Wisp and then there's a, a couple of the adventurers that came in, uh, so on and so forth, that she kind of gets to say, oh, I like that aspect of them. I think I'll emulate that. So she goes from being the, the foul-mouthed, all-time kind of person to having other things happening, which is, it was fun. Uh, seeing her kind of go through this this up and down as to where she's at at the moment kind of personality. Uh, <clears throat> we also get to have two of the toughest protectors pop in to kind of see what's going on uh, with Milton. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff here in the story. Are these agent? are these, these, are the protectors agents of the core power company? Or are they acting on their own? Or is there something more going on? Uh, you know, best of all, Brent kind of manages to discover a huge threat, not only to Milton, but also the entire native populace. Uh, everything seems to kind of go to hell once here as well, which, as you know, is all the fun. That's where all the fun is. That's the meat of the story. It's where everything kind of rocks the world. Um, this, this book, it, you know, I think I said like a dungeon player, there's no tension. This has tension. This has has uh, conflict. And it's got struggles. It's got humanity to it. Um, there's a lot happening here. Um, this is again um, a favorite series of mine. I think that Dungeon World and Station Core, hand in hand, hands down, these are the best books that Ross has produced. I'll try saying that six times real fast. Um, anyway. The, the Dungeon Core novels, you know, that he does are just incredible. The Station Core, it has a whole other flavor to itself because it is a sci-fi feel. And I, I enjoy that too. It's, it's a different mode of play. It's a different mode of fighting. It's a different mode of thinking. Uh, even though it's Dungeon Core. Even though it's a Dungeon Core, there's different aspects that we have to, to uh, you know, focus on. So, you, you know, I, I enjoy sci-fi as much as I do fantasy. And most times, it's books like this are fantasy novels. So it's, it's, it's a good change. And Dungeon World is just right here and right beside the station core for me. Uh, and again, I'll say, you know, Brooks is becoming a, a major player in this little RPG community. Um, so, you know, here's what I'll say this. Um, Miles, Miley, he makes this a fun, fun romp. And I will reiterate that he does a fantastic job. He knows how to play out the jokes and hit the punchlines 
where to make you feel the terror that Rent or Milton feel, uh, and he manages to make you hate the Cord Power people with just several snide comments. Now, of course, he might not have written those snide comments, but he sure as hell snided them up just the right way. Um, he, he really does get Rorschach's concepts as they're hitting the page, and he can reproduce those vocally, uh, which is a rare thing in most narrators. Uh, especially with Brooks, because Brooks narrators are either 100% hit or it's 100% miss. And so far, if it's been Miles Miley, it is a centerpiece shot for the dartboard. If it's not been Miles Miley, it has been anywhere and everywhere around that dartboard, except on the dartboard itself. Um, the cast is slowly growing, uh, but it's keeping pace with the rising dangers. Um, Milton, Milton continues to learn from his mistakes and manage to make some progress in his self-repairs. And it seems like everyone has some character growth while the, the, the greater danger slowly amps up. This is an excellent series that has strong legs and it's really going to go the distance in becoming a brilliant addition to the Dungeon Core genre. Uh, final score, 8.4 stars. I particularly like the science aspect of this dungeon. It sets it apart from most others. Um, like Dungeon World, this world is gradually being unveiled to contain more mysteries and spins uh, than you would imagine. Honestly, just when you think you've had things figured out, you're totally wrong. Totally, totally wrong. So, 8.4 stars. I really recommend this book. <laughs> uh, now. It is time for our sound booth spotlight. <laughs> Today, I feature Dungeon Lord Abdominal Creatures. Abdominal? Like the Abdominal Snowman? No, it's Dungeon Lord Abominable Creatures. Uh, Wraith Haunt Book 3 uh, by Hugo Huesca. Uh, narrated by Jeff Hayes and the ever-lovely Annie Ellicott, with a book length of 19 hours and 43 minutes. Finally! Dungeon Lord Edward Wright, Master of the Haunt. Ah, welcome, Lord Wraith. The Haunt's expenses are hugely demanding. What kind of Dungeon Lord are you? Are you a foot soldier or a general, my lord? Dungeon Lords are magical up to their balls, Kess. Us normals can't compare. Before it befits a Dungeon Lord of my status, are you brave enough to do the honors, Dungeon Lord? Or shall you keep relying on your minions? So, this is one of those quest things that has everyone so excited. I bet it won't be the same unless it's a Dungeon Lord's quest. Most Dungeon Lords use their minions that way. Most Dungeon Lords are now dead. Don't pretend like you didn't miss me. I really have to say I was very, very pleased with how this book turned out. I honestly hadn't expected it to kind of amp up in the third book. Um, I thought books one and two were really good, um, but it just it does. It just kind of really inflates, you know, where the story's going. Uh, Lord Wraith is just as brilliant and conniving as before, but now he has some experience under his belt, and he's really kind of getting used to what it takes to be a dungeon lord. He's not, you know iffy or anything. He's really going out there. He's trying his best. He's working really hard to improve himself. Uh, he's doing whatever he can for the forces of darkness uh, to be repelled. And no matter what they throw at him, he's going to knock it away. Or at least so he thinks. Edward has a lot happening here. And I mean a lot. Um, he's got a uh, de-aged vampire he's kind of added into his clan. And, and we get a really big, big monster battle. Um, and I applaud Edward for sticking to his no-kill rule. And I, I know um, some people might go, you know, this guy's a little crazy, but I, I understand it completely because he realizes that a single misstep, that slippery slope, is going to be something he cannot return from. Uh, you know, he, he does one thing wrong, and he is down the path of darkness, and he will not be able to return. He won't be able to flip back to being a good guy again. You know, it's it. You know, you can talk about like you know, there's no kill rules and stuff like that. And occasionally, the good cop will, will shoot a bad guy because they know that they're going to get away with it and stuff like that. Edward can't do any of that. He is he is tethered to doing the right thing at all times, and it's got to be really, really hard because if not, he's going down that dark intent road. 
And he won't have a flashlight. He won't have a torch. He won't have anything except himself. And he will not know how to get back. There's no way back from that. So it, it's a good little thing to see him struggle with. Um, and he does not want to become one of Charon's, you know, buddies or minions of the darkness. So watching him kind of struggle to reign in his own minions, because he does have issues with his own minions, particularly the, the, the new additions, um, you know, to keep them from killing at times. It's, it's kind of gig inspiring and simultaneously tension building uh, because, you know, nothing good is going to come of it. Even if it doesn't happen right now, there's going to be something that happens in the future, like in book four, uh, that's just going to blow all out of proportion because he couldn't get a rein on his people. And, and what I really liked was how Ed was acting like he was playing like three-dimensional chess with everything. Uh, he goes on a quest to find out how the heroes operate in the world, and once he manages to do that, he tries to suss out a way to stop them, if he can figure out the first half. So, you know, he's got that going on. He's got forces of good and light coming at him. Uh, you know, so he doesn't have a lot on his plate at all. It's, it's pretty much clear. He, he doesn't have a lot to do in the whole book. No, I'm kid kidding. Very clearly, he, he is inundated with troubles uh, from start to finish. And that's, that's one of the great things about this kind of genre uh, is that, you know, you can throw a lot at your characters and, and see how well they react. And Ed's reactions are really, really spot on on how he should do it. I mean, like you say, if he takes one wrong step, he's done. He, he's like walking on real thin glass over an abyss. And, you know, the grass is the glass is just starting to crack. Uh, and it, it's just it's fascinating to watch how he handles everything and juggles so many things. And sometimes things slip through. You know, I don't want to give away a lot, but, you know, sometimes things slip through. So on top of all that, he, he's got to, like, you know, figure out how, how he can rescue this ancient vampire, coordinate and train his troops, get ready to battle some honorable foes who he would really prefer to avoid. Uh, plus, Huesca manages to keep the powers manageable, um, you know, the levels manageable, and not have OPMCs. Uh, he, he does not have main characters or characters in general who really just blow up with their power. And, and I give him a lot of credit because this is kind of a slow build. It is a very slow build, and it, it, it's taking its time to get where it needs to, just as it should. I, I don't like it when stories, well, I, I, can, I can't say I don't like it. But I, I prefer it when stories don't just build up the guy instantly and have this superpowered guy running around, or this woman running around, uh, stopping everything in their path. I like to see them struggle. I like to see them try to do things. And by like book five, what gave them problems in book one should be a cakewalk. It should be a cakewalk. They should be able to go back and go to the same place and say, ha, those little orcs, boink, and, and knock them the crap out. No problem. Whereas in book one, they are struggling to fight the orcs. So, you know, I really, really prefer that, you know, the OP MCs don't exist here. And another benefit is, uh, if you want to know the truth, I love how they do it with, with uh, Sound Booth, is that you can jump the stats if you don't want to have all the crunch. If you do want the crunch, it's there, but if not, you can pass it up. Um, the one real beef that I have with this book is that it repeatedly seems like Ed's old boss is going to get pulled into this world as a hero, or some such, in order to foil Ed. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe he's going to be another dungeon lord, and he's going to be a competitor. But um, it, it just kind of comes back, and, and I think his, well, I don't like his boss at all. Or it could even be his old old gal pal, the one that could have potentially been a love interest or something. Honestly, I, I would stay away from them both. Um, the reason being, his old boss reminds me of the villain from Awaken Online, uh, who was arrogant and so full of himself that he's, he's the best thing he's ever tasted, you know. I'm so great. I'm, I'm delicious. I would eat me if it was me, you know. Um, you know, he drinks his own Kool-Aid about how awesome he is. Um, the possible former love interest is just not all that interesting. And in today's world, you know, all she would have to do to kind of make it an accusation against her boss, and people would be looking into what her boss had said or done to make her so uncomfortable. So, like, that, that trope of, you know, he, he kind of did this or that, and, and she's uncomfortable, and they're, they're, they're kind of being controlled by him. Um, it doesn't really s sing to me as, as much as it should, uh, you know. And it's just, just it's just one of those things where I think that she, it's a toxic environment, and I, I hate characters like that, just because there are so many ways to do it. Like Ed literally dealt with it the best way you could do it. Yeah, he punched the boss in the face and walked the hell out. Uh, no one else has done that so far, even though they've had a really good example of what to do in that situation. Uh, Jeff and Annie, they, they really, I, you know, I say this all the time, Sound Booth, they are, for me, like the premier, premier um, 
recorders, you know, for narration, for for sound editing and for speaking. I mean, they are just like the best company in the world because I, I don't know them ha having done any books that weren't great. Uh, you know, I think my lowest score might have been like a 7.8 or 7.9 for one of their books, and it was just because of issues of the book itself. Nothing to do with them. Uh, so they, they pick winners a lot. Like, they know how to say this book is going to be grand. And that's one of the most important parts of, of their job. Uh, so, again, I'm always going to say, you know, SBT does amazing work. And, you know, if they get when they get going, they just can't be touched. And, and it's really hard because there are other narrators out there who are really good. But SBT has this just, they're a level. There's just a level that's just amazing. Um, you know, Annie, she practically overwhelms with her feminine wiles while simultaneously playing a whacked out ancient bloodsucker that looks like a 12 year old. Uh, I don't know how she does it. That's, that's got to be a hard, hard way to, 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 to speak, you know, because you know uh, they're, they're refined and, and powerful, and at the same time, they're a 12 year old, basically. Uh, physically, so you know you've got to have this voice that commands, threatening, and, and it also has to squeak the voice. You know, don't mess with me, young man. I'll rip your face off. But that—that's the best I can do. I can't stand it. Why do you do this? You know, that would not be the way to do it. And, and she does. She does really, really well. Um, Jeff craftily carries the rest of the book with his narration, intense narration, uh, and masterful manipulation of men and monsters. It's really fun to listen to him talk. Um, just absolutely top-notch performances all around. Fantastic production. Um, the book really sets up at the end some really big things happening. You know, uh, you know, Carolyn is there. He's got stuff happening. His his God has some stuff happening. Uh, Edward has some stuff that he's he's figured out, uh, and even though he kind of gets tricked at the end, he kind of he does kind of suss out one thing that's really important that gives him an edge. Finally, he's got an edge, but he also has a lot of baggage with some of his his assistants now. Uh, there, there there's things that are in the mix that are dangerous to him. So I don't know. It's it's really hard to call, but I'm going to say this is like an 8.3 stars. Um, it was good. The book continues to improve. The stakes are raised every time we, we, we draw to a close. Um, and this is the first time I was really like, oh, it was 19 hours. I wish I had seven more. Uh, as much as I, I've enjoyed the other two books, I really wanted to see this carried on, uh, you know, because we get to see them go on raids and do different things. This was the, the, the final thing that happens here with Edward really, really is a game changer, so to speak. Uh, and I really, really want to see what happens next. So, there you go, 8.3 stars. Don't miss out. This is a great, great book. Well, thank you for having watched the Little RPG Audiobook Dungeon Special. Before I go, one final thing we must do together. <laughs> we must check in with our minions. The minions of madness. I summon the minions once more. Come, return to me now, minions. <laughs> I ask you, did you cause mischief today? Uh huh. What did the you do? I ate the turtles off with this. And what did you do? You stole the muffin man's bread. You stole the muffin man's bread. Uh huh. And you ate the toenails mm -hmm. off of a cat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, now you see the quality of my minions. Thank you for watching. And again, remember, there will be another naughty special just before Christmas. <laughs> really crazy around here. Well, everybody, that, that is a conclusion of the Dungeon Special Part 3 uh, for the audiobook podcast. I'm really sad to see this end. Uh, there are probably several other books I should have tried to get in here, um, but that was a lot. Um, and I, I just kind of think I had to cull it at this point and cut it off, uh, and we'll get to other, other Dungeon books a little bit later, and I'll just do those in the show as normal. Um, I, I try to keep a really good flow, thing, flow of things going, for like specials like Halloween should be 
my holiday to do the dungeon special and Christmas should be the time to do the naughty special. Um, so we'll, we'll do stuff like that. Um, and I just did the wandering in special. And before that I had another special, the Armageddon. So I'm kind of specialed out and I'm going to just kind of keep to the regular series for a little bit. Again, Christmas time, we'll do a naughty special. Um, but up until this point, um, we're good for dungeons for now. Uh, so I want to thank you all for watching and listening. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. Um, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it. I mean, I, the dungeons are probably one of my favorite genres, uh, so to speak. And I, I keep saying that word genre uh, today. Um, but it's just one of those things that I really love to have uh, be a part of. I, I love to be a part of that. I love to experience it because the, the dungeons are a different perspective. They're, they're not something I got in fantasy. Um, nine times out of ten in fantasy, they were a place to go to and destroy or kill everything inside and just move on. They were loot boxes, loot crates, so to speak. Um, so just bear that in mind. And before I go, I do want to just say, you know, one thing. Um, there are several books coming out. Um, if you if you haven't noticed already, uh, Jeffrey Falcon Logue has released uh, Tales of Dungeons, uh, which I'm a part of. Uh, and, and it's it's a good book. I'd like you to at least check that out if you like Dungeons. Uh, it's not on audio yet. I don't know if it will ever make it to audio. I don't know if it will ever get to be put into a book format other than Kindle. Uh, but it's out there for you. I think it's, it's, it's got some really good stories to it. Uh, another thing is that um, the Divine Dungeon Anthology is out, uh, if you haven't noticed that. Um, it comes out at the beginning of November. So it'll be right out after, it'll be out right after this episode airs a few days afterwards um and it was a fun thing uh and I, i'm a part of that too uh yeah so I'm, i guess i'm promoting but i want to let you know that it's not the end of the world for the divine dungeon uh there are other stories that are in there and they they go on they carry on they carry that torch uh that dakota has has you know passed on uh so so it's it's it's, it's a fun read i i know that for me um, I had a lot of fun writing the story for both the Tales of Dungeons and the, <laughs> the, the Essence book. Uh, I really kind of got silly with them. Um, and and the, the great thing about it is, is um, in both cases, I sat down and in the one, the only thing I knew I wanted to do was, like for Essence, I wanted to write a story about a goblin that was in Cal's dungeon. Uh, that was it. And I sat down, and from start to finish, I wrote that entire thing, just as you see it, um, and just kind of told me how I wanted to go. And it was the same thing with the uh, Tales of Dungeons, because I sat down, and the only thing I knew was I wanted a nature dungeon, and I knew there was going to be some sort of undead event happening in there to make a change. Uh, what the dungeon consisted of, how it happened, I had no clue. Um, and I think that for me, my best writing comes when I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's the, the best part is I like being surprised as much as you do. Uh, because I really had like the, the dungeon book, the Tales of Dungeons. It was just for me, it was like, how silly can I get? Uh, how much fun can I have? And I did the same thing with Essence. I said, um, for Splat, I just had to make this just something I would I would love to read. And I get to play in this playground, and if I get chosen, great. If I don't, I had fun. I'll make a few changes, and I'll put it out for myself. Um, and, you know, Splat has become one of my favorite characters because it's just it's such a goofy thing. Uh, and I had some stupid moments to it, you know. I had some, some funny moments to it. And, and so, you know, for those two books, they, they fit this genre, and I really think that you will like them both. I think they're really good novels. Uh, the people, that, aside from myself, that are in them are really great writers. Like, for example, Dakota is in the Divine Dungeon Essence book. Jeffrey Falcon Logue is in uh, the Tales of Dungeons and so on and so forth. And, you know, these are the masters. These are the people that brought us, you know, <laughs> you know today's show has been, been, uh, <laughs> has been brought to you by the letters X and the number one. Okay, uh, well... The dungeon genre has been brought to us by Jeffrey Falcon Logue and Dakota Kraut. Uh, not to say that it, that it didn't exist um, in one capacity or another in the past, but these are the pioneers that really brought it to us. I think Brooks is coming up, and he is going to be one of those people that um, he has an indelible stamp on this genre. 
but like I say, those books have the masters in them. And since I'm, I'm kind of shamelessly promoting, I'm just going to come right out and say, I also have a third book that I'm going to have out next month, um, which is uh, Surviving Ludus, uh, which is set in the world of De uh, Delver's LLC. Uh, and there I have a story about an orc. Uh, and, and it was a story, uh, literally, that um, before I even went to the hospital, I think Blaze had been talking about possibly doing the anthology. And when I read the first Delver's book, there was something that he set up, and I said, I I love that concept, I love that idea, and I had the character and everything in mind before I ever, ever, ever sat down to write it, and I had written it right after he talked about it. Um, he had said something uh, along the lines of, uh, I think I think we may be doing a Delvers anthology, and I mean like the next day I went out and sat down and wrote that story. And then when he made the announcement um, that he, he was accepting submissions, I sat on it. I, I probably sat on it for like two weeks, two and a half weeks, um, because I was like, eh, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know. Um, it was just really bizarre how, how I, I did that with that book, because every other book, I was like, you know, for Viridian Gate, I was like, I'm, I'm doing this. And again, that was just one of those books. I sat down, I, I started it, I knew it was about a spider. Didn't know how it was going to end. The only thing I knew was I wanted it to be one of those classics. Um, the two things that people fight most in the, the game worlds are spiders and rats. And so I said, I want the spider to fight a rat. That was it. That was the whole story for me. That's all I knew going into it. And the whole story unfolded. So um, I, I have a really bad habit of doing that. I never know where I'm going or, or how I get there. I just know this is where I'm going to start. And this should be where I end. And what happens in between is as much a surprise as it is to me as it is for you. So um, with that, I was kind of stunned because I just decided not to put it in. And I just kept going back and forth. Should I submit? Shouldn't I submit? Uh, and finally, I just said, you know what? I've had this story in my head uh, for far too long. I, I need to get it out there. And if Blaze likes it, great. So um, shameless self-promotion is over. I, I, I met that book. If you, you like it, great. I, I think that it's, it's going to be brilliant. I think that uh, I can't wait to read what Blaze has for his story. Uh, so you've got three books out, Essence, Tales and Dungeons, and Surviving Ludus. Uh, that all, I'm sure that in Surviving Ludus there's some sort of dungeon aspect to it uh, that, that uh, I think you would, you would really enjoy. Uh, so just remember, um, if you like the show, please leave comments in the section below. Uh, feel free to tell me whatever you like. I, I really do enjoy the feedback. Um, remember, um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So, you know, again, thank you all for listening. Uh, I, I think this is just one of those things that uh, needed to be done. I think the dungeon genre doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. And so, you know, and it's, it's perfect for Halloween. Perfect for it. So, you know, I just, I enjoyed it very much. So, I'm Ray, and keep listening.